Good afternoon, Botarji. Bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Welcome to the third event of Amazonian Futures, Futuros Amazonicos, a series of conversations the Brazil Lab is organizing together with Amazonia 2030, an interdisciplinary initiative that is creatively tackling what a sustainable development of the Amazon might look like and designing tools to bring the conservation of the threatened rainforest to the center of public debate and alternative policy making in Brazil and internationally. My name is João Bill. I teach anthropology here at Princeton University, and I'm the director of the Brazil Lab at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies. Exactly two years ago, the Brazil Lab and the High Meadows Environmental Institute hosted a conference exploring possibilities of an Amazonian leapfrogging, that is, of countering the current frontier extractivist modus operandi and combining conservation and socioeconomic development in this region assailed as it is by endemic violence and presenting the poorest living standards in the country. The conference unleashed many initiatives, including the timely Amazonia 2030, led by environmentalist Beto Verissimo, who is here with us today, and our good friend, the economist Juliano Sunsal. Our event today follows a recent discussion with environmentalist Tasso Azevedo and scientists Luciana Gatti and Stephen Pecala on Amazonia's alarming deforestation rate and its impact on climate change immediately after the end of COP26 in Glasgow. As Pecala then said, quote, the news on the scientific front is uniformly bleak unless we take really significant public action. There is no Amazonian leapfrogging without innovative and impactful policies uh, combined with sound investments and efforts at guaranteeing social mobility alongside accountability mechanisms and law enforcement. And that's exactly what our distinguished guests are here to tease out today. Safeguarding the Amazon, the key role of public policies. I want to invoke here the wisdom of the luminous political economist, Albert Hirschman, who would always challenge us to clarify what is desirable and expand the domain of the possible and have the right tools at hand when the political window opens up. Beto Verissimo is a treasure without compare. Thank you for all you do, Beto, and for being with us here today. A leading Brazilian environmentalist, he's at the forefront of multi-stakeholders efforts to envision a forested and thriving future for the Amazon and its peoples, He's the co-founder of the influential conservation think and do tank, Amazon, and the creator of the Amazonian Center for Social Entrepreneurship. A Skull Fellow, Beto has published extensively on natural resources management and has led efforts, for example, to create over 25 million hectares of conservation units in the Brazilian Amazon. Beto, we cannot wait to have you back in Princeton to continue the always enlightening conversations with colleagues and students. Clarissa Gandur is an economist who leads the Policy Evaluation Unit at the Climate Policy Initiative Office in Brazil. In her work, Clarissa produces empirical evidence on the effectiveness and impact of key policies aimed at strengthening environmental protection and reducing forest degradation and deforestation, especially in the Brazilian Amazon. Clarissa is currently assessing new challenges and opportunities for enhancing the protection of native vegetation throughout the country. Thank you, Clarissa, for being with us. We are also delighted to have uh, with us today Princeton professor Robert Sokolov, a big picture humanist thinker and a great friend of the Brazil Lab. Rob is deeply committed to the climate cause and has played a critical role in our Amazonian leapfrogging endeavors. He has been a leader in interdisciplinary initiatives on campus in energy and environment since the early 70s, helping to develop what is now known as the High Meadows Environmental Institute. With Stephen Pecala, Rod wrote the groundbreaking study, Stabilization Wedges, Solving the Climate Problem for the Next 50 Years with Current Technologies in 2004. And he has continued since to refine the science of climate change and mitigation efforts with an eye towards nothing but a green planet. So thank you, Beto. Thank you, Clarissa. And thank you, Rob, for speaking to us today. This is our format. Uh, Clarissa and Beto will speak for 15 minutes each. Rob will then have about 10 minutes to offer comments and a few questions to get the discussion going. For the audience watching from home, 
The chat on our YouTube channel is open, so please feel free to ask questions as the event unfolds. Our team will be collecting your questions and will forward them to me. I will then pass them on to our speakers. So thank you all for being here. Clarissa, the screen is yours. All right, thank you so much, Joel, for that very kind um, introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to be here and to be in such great company to discuss this topic. So for someone who has um, only been looking at deforestation in the Amazon over the past decade, this is basically what we would see. A somewhat slow, but certainly steady rise in deforestation rates. Um, over the past three years, which marks the current um, federal administration in Brazil, we actually saw this rate pick up. Um, from compared to 2018, the just recently released rate of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon actually increased by 75%. So we've been for the past three years um, consistently um, deforesting more than 10,000 square kilometers of Amazon forest per year. So this looks pretty dire. And it's in many ways suggests that Brazil doesn't know how to control deforestation. But that's not actually the case because it hasn't always been like this. If we look back over the past two decades, we see quite a different story. So in the very early 2000s, Amazon deforestation rates were actually higher than they are now. Um, and at that time, Brazil was the country that cleared most tropical forests, both in absolute terms, but also relative to its forest cover at the beginning of that period. After peaking at um, massive 27,000 square kilometers in 2004, Amazon deforestation rates actually plummeted by more than 80% within less than a decade. Now, this period of this very sharp Amazon on deforestation slowdown actually coincided with the launch of a novel policy action plan. So in 2004, the Brazilian federal government launched, um, essentially it was a, a strategic set of policy measures to combat deforestation in the Amazon. This set of policies, it, it was quite innovative in content because it proposed novel policy instruments that I'll get to in a second, but it was also quite innovative in terms of its format because it, it changed the way that Brazil tackled deforestation in the Amazon. For the first time, combating deforestation stopped being a responsibility solely of the Ministry of the Environment and it actually became responsibility that was shared across different um, ministries in Brazil. Um, academia has um, assessed the contribution of this policy, of this group of policies to the deforestation slowdown. And today we have robust and rigorous evidence that shows that policy played a key role in reducing deforestation. Many of these policies were still in place um, when the deforestation rate started picking up again in 2012. But what we saw here was that support, political support for combating Amazon deforestation started to wane in this period. And that coincides with when we start seeing um, deforestation rates creep up. Now, as of um, 2019, which is when we had that shift in the federal government, what we started seeing in Brazil was an, an active and an intentional dismantling of conservation policies um, to, com to protect the Amazon. And that coincides with the period when we saw that deforestation pick up and exceed um, 10,000 square kilometers per year. So today, what we're looking at is um, the worst deforestation rate that we've had in the past 15 years. So to be able to say, well, what can we do about what's happening now? It's important to look back and say, well, what worked? How was Brazil successful in combating deforestation um, um, starting in 2004? And I think the key thing to understand here when we're talking about public policy to protect forests is that monitoring and law enforcement, they are critical to protect the Amazon today. The reason for that is, is that Amazon deforestation was, and it still is, predominantly illegal. Um, it might be illegal because it's happening in areas that could potentially have legal deforestation, but the people who are doing, who, who are, who are um, cutting down the forest, they're not in compliance with some environmental regulations for those areas, 
or it might be that the deforestation is illegal because it's essentially happening in in lands where you shouldn't be we shouldn't be seeing any deforestation at all. And so, if we're talking about an illegal um, activity, and the um, some recent estimates um, point to a more than 95% of deforestation happening in the Amazon um, is illegal, right? So if you're talking about an illegal activity, um, that means that there's room for um, law enforcement to inhibit, potentially inhibit this behavior. Now, this was known when the policy action plan was launched and it was actually strengthening monitoring and law enforcement was a priority for that action plan. And within this context, Brazil launched what was then a pioneering system to detect deforestation, to detect forest loss in near real time in the, um, all of the Amazon. So this was a satellite-based system that's known as the TUR, that essentially for a given area, will compare earlier images of that area with the latest available image. When it detects a change in forest cover, which is shown in this yellowish outline in the, in the image, that um, change triggers the issuing of what is known as a deforestation alert. So what you see as these red dots on the map, these aren't actually dots, they're actually areas which say, which flag, well, this specific location has had recent deforestation activity. Those alerts were then sent to the Brazilian um, Environmental Law Enforcement Authority, and they were used to target law enforcement efforts. Okay. Now, uh, Carissa, just sorry to interrupt. Uh, sure. I think um, you need to restart sh sharing the screen so we oh, can apologies. see. Apologies. No, 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 no problem. When did you guys lose me? No, I think you're pretty well. Uh, uh, just uh, the, can you the, see the, me now? The slides, the slides almost not necessary because you explained so well that we can't exactly. follow the slides. That's so. very kind. I apologize for that. No, we were on our toes here. Your narrative was incredible. Yes, we can but see were you, Thank you. Were you not seeing this at all? No, no. Oh, 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 okay. no. No, oh, no. Now we can see it now because we were talking about the red dots and now we can yeah. see the red dots. Yeah, Thank that's you. fine. I now. apologize. I apologize. You, well, you, you were, you you were spell, you're spellbinding without them. Thank you. I apologize. I will just brush in 30 seconds just so you guys know what I was talking about. This is what we were talking about. Rising deforestation over the past decade, an increase of 75% um, in the past three years. Um, hasn't always been like this. Right, so we actually saw deforestation rates plummet starting in 2004. So that's a reduction of 80%, okay? Um, that coincides with the adoption of the policy action plan. But then starting in 2012, we start to see waning support for these um, for conservation policy in the Amazon. And within um, the past three years, we start to see that more active dismantling of conservation policies, right? So that brought us to well, what worked in the past and how can we improve? And then here we go. We're going to see the maps I was talking about. So we now know that deforestation is mostly illegal, but Brazil implemented this novel um, satellite monitoring system. So we compare pictures, which now you can all see. Um, we compare earlier images for a given area with late or with more recent images for that area. We see that change in forest cover in the um, but you know what? I just realized you guys aren't seeing my full screen. You should be seeing the full screen now. Um, we see the change in forest cover that triggers the deforestation alerts, which are not red dots, but they are actually areas that gets sent to the law enforcement authority and it's used to target um, law enforcement efforts. Okay, so why was this so relevant for um, conservation in the Amazon? Basically, um, being able to get to deforestation as it happens is crucial for law enforcement's capacity to provide a, a timely and a binding response. Because what the system did is that it essentially provided for a vast territory, information in near real time, these alerts were daily alerts, that allowed law enforcement authority to get to these deforestation activities, and that enhances their capacity to hold um, offenders responsible, and crucially to apply binding and costly penalties. Because um, law enforcement, they can fine these offenders, but these fines, they will go into this 
fairly long legal process. They might take many, many years to actually be paid, but law enforcement personnel, if they catch um, offenders red-handed, they can actually um, seize pr products that were illegally produced, can seize machinery, they can destroy machinery. So think about the, the cost, the burden that is to have a tractor being destroyed, right? And so um, what we have today is um, academic um, evaluations that have tried to assess the contribution of this whole framework of monitoring and law enforcement. And what we find is that these efforts, not just the satellite system itself, but the whole framework of, of um, targeting law enforcement activity based on these um, deforestation alerts, that this was highly effective to protect the Amazon. And so um, one estimate suggests that in this hypothetical scenario in which we essentially shut down monitoring law enforcement efforts, um, within um, a 10 year period, we would have seen more than five times um, more deforestation than would have actually observed during this period. This amounts to um, about 27,000 square kilometers of forests that were not deforested thanks to the monitoring and law enforcement efforts. And so, but we might say, well, okay, so this works, but is it worth it? Could it maybe have some sort of, is it too costly? What the evidence also suggests is that um, conservation did not interfere with agricultural production. And also that the benefits of protecting the forest far outweigh the costs of doing so. And so it's a policy effort that works and that it is relative, relatively cheap so to speak, and doesn't seem to have um, many negative consequences. So monitoring law enforcement, critical, but not the only thing that happened and not the only thing that worked, right? So there were several other policy efforts that were implemented within this larger framework of the policy action plan, right? And we can roughly separate them into two groups. One for which today we have some quite robust causal evidence of impact. This includes the targeting of critical areas, so um, places that were concentrating deforestation. It includes the use of financial instruments, so um, the conditioning of access to rural credit, which is a very important support mechanism for agricultural production in Brazil, um, um, to be able to access a rural credit. Um, potential borrowers within the Amazon had to prove compliance with environmental and land titling regulations. And Brazil also implemented the strategic siting of protected territories. So territorial protection has long been used, but within the context of um, this policy action plan, these territories, um, in addition to environmental and biological um, criteria, they also started taking into account the risk of deforestation that these territories were under. So they were, they, they were meant to serve as barriers, and they did. There is evidence that show that these territories serve as shields, essentially, to advancing deforestation. Now, there's another set of policies um, that were also implemented or efforts that were implemented for which we have um, somewhat more limited causal evidence. These include some supply chain initiatives, most notably the soy moratorium, um, several different projects um, regarding payment for ecosystem services at um, um, household and community levels, and, and some subnational initiatives. When I say that the evidence here is a bit more limited, that is not to say that these didn't work but rather that we don't know as much about their impact. We don't know as much about the scale of their contribution and about the mechanisms. So this is actually um, an opportunity for further assessment of these several um, efforts. But taken all together, what this, what this points to is that monitoring law enforcement are fundamental. They're at the core of protecting the forest, but that an effective conservation strategy requires several complementary policies and coordinated action. So it's important to highlight that within the context of the policy action plan, um, there was um, an orchestration of all of these different efforts so that they could complement and enhance each other. So based on this, where do we go from here, right? So I would say that there are um, three main courses of action for policy to um, protect the Amazon today. The first one is Brazil must absolutely commit or rather recommit, I guess, to the fight against deforestation. And what is key here is that we must eliminate impunity regarding deforestation in Brazil. If it's illegal, it needs to be um, uh, sanctioned in some way. There must be a cost of engaging in legal activity. And so we must strengthen monitoring and law enforcement. And just to give you guys a sense 
of what we're looking at in terms of monitoring law enforcement at the moment. Here, we're looking at the number of fines that, were, that can be directly associated with deforestation in the Amazon. So that's the darker um, line at the bottom and the number of embargoes that are applied. There are different types of administrative sanctions that can be applied in the Amazon. Um, looking at numbers isn't the whole story, right? But it does give us a sense of what's going on in the field. Because recall that this is a period when deforestation was rising. And particularly over the past three years, deforestation was rising fast. And what we see is this general um, decrease in um, essentially what captures the, the presence of law enforcement out in the field. So at the moment, we have the highest deforestation rate of the past 15 years and the lowest um, sanctions and the lowest levels of embargoes also of the past um, decade or even more so. And so we must strengthen monitoring law enforcement. And a key point, um, a key element to that is that Brazil must find ways of shielding environmental law enforcement from political control, because that has significantly weakened its capacity to provide um, a binding and a timely law enforcement response. The evidence also suggests that Brazil must prioritize critical areas. And this can be essentially designed um, into different, although related ways. On one hand, um, deforestation in the Amazon exhibits a very large spatial concentration. So over the past five years, half of deforestation happened in only 24 municipalities. And we're talking about um, an area that has more than 500 municipalities if we focus on, on where the forest um, is, right? These municipalities account as giving us a sense of territory for about 20% of Amazon territory. So we see that they, they concentrate a disproportionate share of deforestation and they must be targeted. And Brazil already has the policy framework for targeting these areas, right? And in addition to that, another um, uh, uh, group of, of territories that must be prioritized are the public forests, the non-designated public forests, right? So these aren't protected areas, but they are public forests um, that are being subjected to land grabbing. So this is basically the illegal occupation of these public areas. And over the past 10 years, about a third of deforestation has happened in these areas. And this is unambiguously illegal deforestation because these are public territories where you cannot have any sort of um, deforestation. And so this must, of course, be targeted. So it is crucial to commit to the fight against deforestation, but that's not the only thing that is needed to protect the forest, right? So Brazil must move beyond um, combating deforestation. And there are two key areas here. So the first one is that Brazil must understand and target forest degradation. So forest degradation is the partial loss of vegetation. So this is typically associated with selective logging, with forest fires, with, the, with essentially um, when you cut down a forest and you expose the remaining forest to, to elements that weren't, it wasn't exposed to before, we call that a border effect. It might sound like forest degradation isn't as bad as deforestation because it's the partial loss, but um, there is actually evidence that forest degradation severely jeopardizes forest resilience and the capacity of that forest to provide ecosystem services. And moreover, it affects a huge area in the Amazon. Estimates vary a little bit because it's a harder phenomenon to, to measure, but um, there is this general consensus that more than twice the area that's annually affected by deforestation is affected by degradation. So it's huge. And we know fairly little about it at the moment, right? So Brazil needs to expand its understanding of degradation. There is some preliminary evidence that degraded areas, they don't quickly convert to deforestation. So it doesn't sound like degradation is a first step in a process of clearing land, right? So we need to understand what are the, the drivers, what are the economic drivers of this phenomenon? And in, in understanding that, we can try to, to design and tailor policy to, to target and to fight forest degradation and understand how this phenomenon might respond. And the third course of action, which is the second one to move beyond deforestation, is that Brazil must monitor and protect forest regrowth. So um, essentially forest regrowth is a vegetation that grows back in areas that have been um, deforested. And what we see is that about the quarter of the area that has been historically cleared in Brazil has forest regrowth. It sounds like good news for you saying, well, okay, the forest has the capacity to grow back, 
But in fact, it actually points to highly wasteful and inefficient pattern of land use because we're still cutting down primary forests and we're essentially abandoning those areas, right? Because this is mostly um, um, passive regrowth. At the same time, it does point um, for very substantial potential um, for large scale and cost effective ecosystem restoration, just because there's so much deforestation, so much deforest, um, so such a large deforested area and such a large degraded area in the Amazon, right? Now, a key element here is that forest regrowth today is absolutely vulnerable. That's because it's invisible to our monitoring systems. Brazil's systems to monitor the forests, the official systems, they were designed to detect the loss of primary forest. And so we can't measure it, so we can't track forest regrowth over time. And fundamentally, we can't protect it. We don't have an alert system for the loss of secondary vegetation. Um, it's important to highlight that today, the, the limitation here is not of a technological nature. The technology exists. Brazil has the capacity, the technical capacity to do this. It needs political support. And so just to wrap up, I apologize for going a little bit um, over time since I catch you all of you guys in the dark at the beginning. But just to wrap up with this key message is that public policies, they can protect the Amazon. They have done so in the past. And Brazil has very good information today about what works, what needs to be improved, and how we, it can move forward and enhance Amazon protection. It just needs to do it. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Carissa, for this incredibly eloquent and sharp and to the point and you know, thought-provoking and forward-looking presentation. Really appreciate it. Beto, the screen is yours. Okay, and that uh, would be fantastic to have uh, Clarissa on front because I think she covers most of things that I want to say. So I try to be briefly uh, to keep the conversation moving on. Um, and she, she mentioned the forestation and forest degradation moving up at just the last number, 22% increase uh, the last year. Yeah. Um, we have this 52% of the green guys' house emission comes from the Brazilian Amazon and the economy, it's just 9%. So it, it doesn't really uh, make sense. Such, ma uh, such emission, level of emission for uh, um, uh, so little in terms of uh, economic output. Uh, one thing that, that's changed a little bit what uh, Clarissa mentioned, that's the organized crime is moving up. So we don't have it, this problem uh, uh, 15 years ago uh, as we have now. So it's something that, that we're going to challenge because I think organized crime, uh, uh, gold mining, especially uh, illegal logging are really um, mess up a lot of things that, that used to be more effective as well the land speculation, the whole the land grabber, the, the whole attempt of those people to claim the land, to claim it public forest. So it's a lot of uh, uh, just example uh, when the, um, everybody and the planet last year was in, at home because the COVID, the, 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 the illegal loggers, the, the gold miners was very active. So <laughs> deforestation moving up even the, when the year that almost everybody was, was at home. Uh, just to, to have the map uh, that Clarice mentioned, the, the red parts are the deforestation that's mapped for the up to 2020. The green areas are forest. The yellow ones are more savanna type of vegetation. As uh, Clarissa point out, not all the green are in good shape. There are some parts of the green that are actually being degraded. So we don't have the monitoring at large scale to show a more like a, a it's not like, like a binary, the forest and, no, and the forestation to get a, a little bit more uh, on the, the, the green areas with some level of degradation. So we, we need to be alert because it's a lot of discussion about the tipping point. At the tipping point, uh, people have said the tipping point might reach around 25% of the forestation. Uh, we have now 20% of the area has been already clear cut. But we might be close to the tipping point because when you look at the, the forest degradation, we can add a little bit out of 20%. So get 20% of deforestation plus at least 20% of forest degradation. So those area has been quite critical. If you have a, a strong El Nino or extreme event, um, you can have larger forest fires um, that can create a, a disaster. So uh, we don't need it. The, 
of course, the zero deforestation is, is the agenda that needs to be put in place now. Uh, we already have clear cut enough area, don't need any more. There's a lot of land being degraded and abandoned. Economic growth does not require deforestation. We, 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 the economy was growing the last 10 years when the deforestation was moving down. Uh, market increasing call for the end of deforestation. We got a lot of pledge for investors from the market. They don't need it, don't want to have any product come from illegal source. Uh, deforestation generates a lot of unnecessary public expanding uh, and, and that's very bad for the Brazilian treasure, doesn't need it. Uh, and I think more important, forest has increased in value and in strategic importance. I think more and more we see uh, that the, bio the biodiversity, the environmental service that provided by the forest, it's so critical and so important for Brazil and for the, for the planet. Um, I think we have three major tasks and I think Clarissa covers very well. We know how to control deforestation. We don't need money, we need political will. What the Brazilian needs right now is a political will to control deforestation. And deforestation, it's possible to control. We know how to create and implement and protect the areas. We did quite well. And the question now, and that, that's the challenge for the Amazonia uh, 2030 initiative, is how to develop a low carbon economy with forest sustain in the context of the, Amazon, of the Brazilian Amazon. That's our major, uh, let's say, task now. And that was the, the project that started after the leap seminar of uh, Leapfrog Amazonia. Um, we are in a process now to carry out several studies. We got about 50 studies going on right now on the social and economic and environmental dimension. I'm not going to talk in details about this now. I think uh, part of this study is going to be presented next year. We got to have a meeting in Princeton and we have some of those results has come up now. But the idea is to present uh, for the major candidates in 2022, both at federal level and state level in the Amazonian states, a kind of blueprint what they what Brazil can do about the development and economic development and of course take the lessons learned from the past on the on the, on the control and, and the conservation uh, I think the idea is to have this this initiative going on uh, as, a, as a kind of long-term vision with midterm goal of 2030 that's the idea that we need like, like at least a 10-year period to have some uh, major results on economic development, but I think we can have uh, in a short period of time results of re reducing in terms of reduction of deforestation and um, questions that I'm not going to talk about, but we get questions that has been driving a little bit to what we are uh, trying to uh, address. Uh, of course, the whole question of, of how to use in the current policy framework uh, for uh, ecosystem protection and of course, improve the well-being of people. Uh, instruments for attract investment and to develop a low carbon economy in the regions. There are some opportunities for leapfrogging coming from the far industrial revolution. What need the, some leapfrogging opportunities for the regions? Uh, the question of identity culture, I think we need to look at as well and the whole aspects of urbanization. Um, that's, uh, we look at the Amazonia as four kind of different Amazonia, it's, a, it's a different zones. The, the white here, it's the, what we call savanna type of Amazonia. You always were savanna. So of course, soybean grows very well in this white part of the territory. We've got the red ones, the municipality that has been uh, deforested more than 80% of the territory. So it's, it's what we call the red zone. At the area that we need to uh, ecosystem restoration, we need to improve infrastructure, we need to improve the land land use intensification. The yellow here is the area where we have a lot of uh, pressure right now. That's uh, the area under tremendous pressure. The forestation is moving up very quickly, and the green areas is the most remote and I say passive protected part of the Amazonia territory. So you look at the, we have to look at solutions and the problems look at at least these two, four major categories of the territory. Um, I'm jumping a little bit on the two, this two part here, because I think Larissa Red uh, mentioned, and I just find that things that we are looking as an opportunity, land use intensifications, of course, is absolutely needed and obvious. 
and, and we need it, but we need to close the frontier. If the frontier keep open and the forestation keep in moving up, it will be hard to think about land use intensification. Land use intensification started when the forestation ends. Uh, forest restoration at large scale, this is a tremendous opportunity for Brazil and for the Brazilian Amazon contributes to the, the large uh, needed for uh, forest restoration. I think forest plantation as well, it's, it's, it's a part of the territory that has so much capacity to, to grow trees. And the whole aspects of food systems based on forests and agroforestry, forest carbon markets, so, so many opportunities. But again, if those opportunities are going to be arrived only with after we did and solve it, the, the high level of criminal, criminality and illegal deforestation that's uh, happened right now. And I, I'll stop it here uh, to have uh, Professor Robert Sokolov comments and I'll, I, I can, I'll be back in with more details uh, on the, the, the part of the, the, the debate. Thanks, João. Okay. Thank you so much, Beto, for this very sharp again and forward looking uh, presentation. So Rob, the screen is yours. Okay. Oh, what did I just do? Excuse me, one minute. Okay. Um, yep, so you can see it. That's, Thank you. That's fine. Yeah, so. Um, it's a great honor to be able to participate in this event and to comment on two people who are spending their careers with such devotion to a cause that so many of us around the world care about. We are just incredibly fortunate. Um, I did talk uh, two years ago at the meeting that was, has been mentioned, Amazonian leapfrogging. I don't know if everyone knows the word leapfrogging. That picture was there too remind people that it's a children's game where somebody comes from behind and moves forward ahead of the per previous person. The boy is leapfrogging over the girl. And, um, and I'm using a few of the same slides. In the past two years, Amazonia 2030 has emerged from its very beginnings to be a very substantial effort. So by the way, has the Brazil lab here at Princeton. Uh, quite a lot has happened in spite of COVID uh, in this time period in both places. I showed this slide, um, and it was quite provocative uh, two years ago. It is a picture from 1872 drawn uh, to celebrate the conquest of the West uh, by, the, uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the Americans, or by the, the, recent, the recently arrived Americans, who saw the West as their open frontier. This woman is bringing light into the darkness. She has a telegraph wire around her right arm and a wire that runs then through her fingers and is lacing the various telephone poles that are to the right in the center. And both, both Native Americans and bison are fleeing the space. And this was meant to be, uh, meant to be glorious. The, we, the, the West was, a, was being conquered for the benefit of civilization, Western civilization to be sure. When I was in Brazil, I've not been in Brazil very many times, but I, I had the relate, I had the idea in my some time back that the that the story of Brazil in some sense resembled this when Brazil's north was America's west. Um, but I've been told many times that there is no there's no equivalent of manifest destiny uh, in the thinking about of the Brazilians, at least not much of it. Uh, but nor is there the contrary. It is sort of it's it's a fallow space waiting for discussion. And so my, my main point here is that what we may be able to do from Princeton is to encourage conversations about contending visions of the future of the Amazon uh, so that what, what we're hearing makes a little more sense than it frankly does now when it seems as if there's a side for which, it, which is um, for virtue and a side which is for uh, evil. And it must be more complicated than that. But is the, is the future, one future, the default future, I would call it, is that basically laissez-faire economics, um, there is value to the resources 
and 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 that there's nothing wrong with losing the Amazon in favor of 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 a industrialized society. Perhaps half of Brazil's population lives in Amazon. It looks just like every other part of the of Brazil with roads and mining and cattle feedlots and genetic driven agriculture, genetics driven agriculture and shopping malls. It is one continuous large country as the US is today where you can plop yourself down in almost any state in the country in a downtown area and ask yourself, do you know where you are? And it's quite hard, there's nothing, sig no signatures. So it, that's the default. Now, what else is there? Before I do that, this was part of Manifest Destiny was the building of first, first trails, first exploration by Lewis and Clark in the canoe, uh, then the trails and then the, the horse communication and finally the railroad, all of this quote, opening up the West. This was a 19th century sensibility, very little, virtually very little appreciation for the psychological and biological value of nature. And, of, and, and, and this is where we got to. And we're a prosperous country. So it's, it's got its mag magnetic force. Um, we, the, if you study uh, environmentalism in America, you are brought to a conflict in the first decade of the 20th century when two famous Americans, both caring very much about the forest, Gifford Pinchot and John Muir. The pictures here in both cases, Teddy Roosevelt, the president uh, in that same time period for eight years, 1901 to 1909, himself a environmentalist is, as, is on both sides of the story as a good politician would be. And, and Mitt Pinchot's vision and became the US Forest Service. Muir's vision became the US National Park Service. Entirely different rules of governance of the land. The Pinchot's phrase was uh, multiple use of the, of the forest, not just for le not leaving it alone. And the National Park Service is forests that are essentially, and a land in general, that is not to be intruded upon by any industry at all. They both coexist. They are alternate versions, alternate visions of, of the uh, Amazon, Amazonia, neither of which I think is appropriate, but they add to your, uh, the, the richness of the conversation you can have. Uh, Pinchot's vision, um, it's close to some of what I'm reading in what you've been, what you, and, and hearing here. Um, if, if to the extent that you want the, uh, the sustainable development of the Amazonian forest based on natural products, I think you're, you're skating on thin ice because Pinchot takes that and says, well, a tree can be cut down and another one can grow. And we have, we have the timber industry and we have the paper industry. You have that in your Atlantic forests in Brazil already. Um, and uh, is that what is the where is the fire break between the Brazil nut on the one hand and the piece of timber on another? I'm not quite sure. Um, but basically, the argument I'm hearing is one that is difficult to sustain, difficult to, to win, uh, in which you say that the value of a tree is that it is never cut down. We're having a conversation similar to that in climate change. We're saying the value of oil is greater in the ground than brought to the surface, um, which is uh, an unfamiliar and unprecedented view of the natural world, uh, but one that is gaining, uh, gaining uh, influence appropriately because it is that very same resource that is bringing us a dangerous climate change. So the idea that we're going to have a vision based on leaving the tree intact, not even sustainable, uh, nominally sustainable uh, forestry for commercial forestry for timber and paper uh, is, is, uh, is going to be an uphill battle, but I think it needs to be made explicit and isn't explicit. I bring to this session a long association with Jose Goldenberg, who is responsible, I think, for, for popularizing the idea of leapfrogging. Like him, I was a physicist and turned into an energy guy a half a century ago. He spent a lot of time with us. He hosted my groups of students, including for a trip to Manaus. And his sugarcane ethanol, he personifies the sugarcane ethanol program of Brazil, is one of the reference uh, stories for um, the leapfrogging idea. 
and it's right in your backyard. Uh, he and uh, put forth another image, which has a bit of physics uh, reference in it, which is tunneling. So that he, the, the usual wealth pattern brings a lot of ill while, he, while you industrialize and go up over this hill. And then you finally have the resources to invest in pollution control or reducing inequality or becoming more energy efficient. Tunneling through is, a, is an alternate image to leapfrogging going on that straight line instead of going up over the top of the curve. You never experience anywhere near as much damage. Um, so now we have climate added to everything else. And this is an image of the carbon balance of the atmosphere looking over a 250 year period where the fossil fuel, where we start at the left and you end up at the right adding, bar, adding bricks and then removing bricks coal, oil, and gas, and cement, and critically, land use additions to the atmosphere by cutting down forests or converting land, losing carbon from soil. For example, all, this is the one we're talking about today, comparable in size to coal, bigger than oil or gas, maybe about to equal to the two of them. And then fortunately for us, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is encouraging land use growth so that forests are left alone are actually getting somewhat bigger in their standing carbon. And the ocean is taking up some of the carbon dioxide as well. It does make the surface acidic, which carries its own problems. But the end, we end up here, uh, and this is 2012 and 2021 is substantially higher, more or less at the top of the numbers there, because the CO2 is continuing to grow. Uh, we are nowhere near putting this problem under control. But bearing in, bear in mind how important biological carbon is to the climate problem is the message I want to give from this, from this picture. Um, and then there's a, there's a wonderful non-governmental organization in Princeton called Climate Central. And just yesterday, I saw a set of pictures from them that I had not seen before. They were developed, <coughs> they were developed for the Glasgow COP26. That, as you know, just happened. They were shown there, and they were from all over the world. You can dial your city. They were making the distinction between the sea level. If we really got to the goals we've been enunciating in the Paris and Copen at the Paris and Glasgow process of one and a half degrees versus three degrees in terms of what's the water doing. You know that you better than I do in Copacabana. And here's the water at three meters. It's not fun. Uh, this is the reference place. If you go to Climate Central, you can get led immediately to this software. Here's another pair for, for Fortaleza, Fort, Fortaleza, yes. And then, um, and then uh, uh, so here's dry and wet. Here's Recife at the stadium. I think I went too fast. Here's Recife at the stadium. And here is Rio at the Federal, at Universidad Federal. I, some, I suspect some of you have actually studied there or lectured there. And it looks like that with three meters of sea level rise. Or I'm not sure, something like three, three meters of sea level rise. I don't know the number of meters, it's in temperature here. So images that say that it's not just, it's in the interest of the resilience to care about climate change. It's not a Western uh, indulgence or a hobby. It's gonna hurt everybody. And so everybody is in it together. But why is Amazonia so important? Environmental values are under unprecedented threat all over the world, but maybe nowhere as acutely as in Brazil. It may be number one in terms of the, what's this, how high the stakes are at the present time. And environmental conflicts, I remember hearing this when I first got into this field, you never win the war, or only win battles. And then there's another battle, and there's another battle. Uh, you might get some relief with a more enlightened president, but don't be sure you won't see another Bolsonaro after that. Clearly, Amazonian leapfrogging could lead to first-in-class wilderness protection and first-in-class sustainable cities. The upside of Brazil being a demonstration to the world is fantastically high. Um, and we at Princeton are ready for more. Um, environmentalism, from you and from us as a collaboration. Environmentalism fosters a planetary identity. We become earthlings, each of us have a stake in the well-being of every region on the planet. We actually have a stake in what happens in the Amazon here in Princeton. 
and, and then it becomes, then there's the third party influences. We have, I, I, I'm not gonna live long enough to, to see what happens to the Congo where we're hardly paying any attention right now, but so much will be in common uh, recapitulating a Brazilian story. If you can get certain things straight, maybe they can be leapfrogging and the Congo will not repeat. We have sort of Indonesia in the worst case, Brazil in the middle, and the Congo hardly started yet in terms of some kind of progression. Uh, how will that go? And are you guys finding ways to collaborate with people thinking about the future of the Congo? Maybe you are the people who will think about the future of the Congo. And I hope we in Princeton can be helpful in promoting conversations um, about your contending destinies. You're ready for more. So I'm supposed to come up with two questions and here they are. First, uh, I am concerned that I'm not hearing enough about what rich people are doing, uh, following the law, but the law has been made put in their favor, speculating on land, making money, um, and driving a lot of the process that you're talking about, even though it's remote from what's actually happening on the ground. And hedge funds, which look for opportunities with a lot of less supervision. To what extent are they, are they actors in the deforestation story? So that one has to go after them and that's hard to do because they have a lot of influence. But is that part of the story? That's my domestic Brazilian question. And my international question is, give us advice of two kinds and one each from each of you, something we really can be helpful if we do. And something we really should bite our tongues, grab our, grab our, grab our uh, hold our own hands and make sure we don't do because it would actually make things worse. So that's it, thank you. Hope I haven't done too long. Not at all, not at all. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you for your partnership, for your wisdom. And, uh, and I will turn it to, to Clarissa and, um, and Beto to, to react to some of the big picture ideas that Rob um, threw at us with-, yeah. with Maybe start with, with of Clarissa. Yeah. Yeah. Start with go Clarissa. Ahead, then. Go ahead, Beto. I started, I started beforehand, okay. go ahead. I think it, what we, we mentioned that right now with the, legal, the level of illegality, impunity and organized crime moving up in the Amazonian regions, it, it's very tough to think about economic development because you have to attract money investors and people are look at the Amazon as too risk. The good business want to look at, okay, this is too risk and the government have to play a, a first role. I think. That's, I think it was very good to, to, to point out the, our session today, the role of public policy. I think Brazil needs to kind of clean the, ma the mess. It's too, it's too, right now, the situation is getting too complicated, more than, than I think we expected, uh, with no sign of, of improvement so far. Um, of course, I think on the second part of uh, specific on the, on the um, on opportunity, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And I think there is a, a important line that have to be, that divides uh, what's, what's the, the opportunities and the problems. Um, for example, gold mining, it's, it's a problem. It's illegal, it's affecting indigenous territory, it's, it's them and destroy the rivers. Industrial mine, iron and bauxite can be part of the solution. We have, uh, already companies that operates in the region um, that has been uh, part of far part of the I would say can be part of the solution. When I go the timber, I, of course Brazil can be an important source of tropical timber, and a lot of uh, good companies actually operating here. But they have to be completely a part of illegal uh, timber, a predatory um, forex um, um, exploration. So we get this line between. Uh, what the opportunity, I think the Amazon region can be part of a place that we can uh, grow soybean, no problem. There is a red plant of area has been a red clear cut. It's just to be, have to follow the law, have to reclaim some land that has been destroyed and can be uh, produce uh, beef in some area. Okay, we can do, uh, we need, there's a lot of room for improvement. The, the, the level of productivity is so low now, it's, it's so low. Uh, just to Costa Rica, another country that's tropical country, uh, the productivity is 20 times higher than us. Why? 
because the, there's a land, the plant of land, people just keep keep um, cutting down the forest. So it's, it's no incentive to, in, to land intensification. So the whole aspects of far carbon economy. So I, I think on one hand, if the government play its role, it creates uh, and, and, and back what works in the past, back now with some improvement, as Larissa say, we need to go further. Uh, we need, we have more technology. The satellite image is much better today. Um, the market for, let's say, the concern and the market for, let's say, green product, even more important today. Um, Brazil can be, of course, uh, a, a, a green superpower in the 21st century. If Brazil, okay, okay, let's develop the region. Brazilian Amazon is just 25 million people in a, in an area. Uh, it, it's a huge territory for a lot of relative is more amount of people. So it's not a demographic, no a population pressure here. The problem is it's, it's the lack of, of government, uh, role of the government. So I think the role of government, it's key if you want to develop in the Amazon region and a destiny that for me, the destiny to, to be uh, a, a place that holds forests, provide environmental service and, 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 and at the same time, improve the life of people that lives there. Um, so I, I Clarice may be, Enter the do and don't <laughs> part of the, the question. So, but I, but I think I will, I will hold you both. I will hold you both accountable to the do and don't. But Clarissa, maybe you can jump into the question of the land speculation, the, Rob's first question. I will. All right. Thank you. I, I have to say, I really like the do and don't question. So I will answer that one as well. <laughs> um, so just to start with the, with the land speculation, and, and that is an absolutely critical um, point, and, and it does need to be discussed. And, and as I mentioned, we know that for the past about decade, I, I mentioned the third, that's what it looks like now, a third of deforested areas happen in these, in these public non-designated territories, but that has actually been increasing over time. At the beginning, like 10 years ago, it was about a quarter and now we're at a third and it might well be there are some signs that a lot of very recent deforestation activity and a lot of recent fires are concentrated in these areas. And so when I say that these are not um, designated areas, they're public forests, that they're, but they're not, they haven't been assigned um, as a protected area or as an indigenous territory, right? Just so to give a yeah, just to give a sense of territory, it's the size of California, Oregon, Washington State combined. That's the area that we not designate for us. That's a lot of uh, the for illegal deforestation happening right now. It's massive. And, and we're, we see deforestation happening and we see a lot of, of these territories that they're being um, registered as private properties in some in some registries, right? So there's a lot of evidence that, that people are essentially stealing the land. Right, and, and, and that's critical, not only because it concentrates um, deforestation, but also this is linked to a highly, it's not at all productive. Deforestation here isn't happening for food production, for example. I mean, you might see pasture in these areas, but the pastures there just as a means of occupying the land, right? So what's pushing this forward isn't um, greater demand for these agricultural goods, but rather, what's pushing this is just this this um, this movement to increase the, the the just to take ownership of the land and then sell it at a, a profit later. And there's actually um, recent evidence that shows this that shows looking at, at at land prices and shows that whereas in the rest rest of Brazil, where you see an increase in, for example, pasture areas, you see an increase in land prices because you see an increase in demand, and so you know this this land is being valued in the Amazon. As pasture increases, you actually see um, an overall decrease in, in land prices. So that's evidence that this the increase in pasture is actually linked to um, speculation and land grabbing, illegal land grabbing. So it's not a productive um, activity, which in a way reinforces the need that we must just cut this at its root. You know, there is no excuse for this to be happening. It's illegal and it's not it's not um, serving any productive means. Sorry to Sorry to interrupt, but like, uh, but it, it's so fascinating what you're saying. And what could be done in terms of a policy? Could a presidential decree do something in transforming those areas, in legalizing? Like, what is the actual policy, or which actor could make something to protect that area right now, or in the new year after 
the, uh, the election, the new president? Well, in the very short term, Joel, what we need is law enforcement. In the very short <laughs> term, what we need is like, these areas are not designated now. And we know that deforestation is happening there now. So we need a law, a quick and, and a strong law enforcement response to inhibit further um, occupations, right? In a, in a more, let's say, in the medium to long term, then yes, there's a lot of discussion about designating these areas. So for example, if these areas are assigned to um, protection, we know that protective territories work, right? There, um, there are already some policies of um, assigning um, some of these areas might become forest concessions, which might be used for productive means within, you know, a reasonable um, um, a management plan, right? So you that so that you can reconcile some sort of um, um, economic production with conservation, right? But there's also um, a risk of some of the changes that happen, some of the, the 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 movements and the discussions that are signaling tolerance with illegally occupied areas. And that's critical because what, what the signal that's being sent out there is that, well, you can occupy these areas illegally and eventually, you know, this area will be yours and you will have the legal, um, the legal rights to it. And that's very dangerous, right? Because if you signal tolerance now, you essentially create this perverse incentive to, to keep furthering this, which is why, again, I know I keep coming back to this point, but we really need strong law enforcement to, to just hold this back and then even to be able to later assign these territories, you know, um, effectively. One, one uh, there is a provision, a law right now that the, the law in Brazil allows the federal government to kind of frozen the territory up to 14 months. I say no deforestation in the zone, no land title in the zone. We are going to or every 14, 14 months to designate this area. So we don't need a new law. We need to the government to actually to work to operate in the law that already existed. Um, and so there is a pathway to solve the problem, given the legislation that we have. But what's now having the Congress is, an, is an attempts to legalize those illegal occupations. So the, 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 there's an attempt of, to create a new laws that actually um, create um, a solution for the, the land grabbers. Um, so that's the... Uh, that's the point. And then now, now fast forwarding a bit to that question that Rob asked of, of, the, of the audience, right? Um, uh, the do's and don'ts, since we are all in, in all of, we, we are in this together, right? Very powerfully uh, said by, by Rob, you know, what are the do's and don'ts to the well-meaning audience or public? start with that because um, we have to start with the with the last one um I, I like this question i really like this question and um i would say that a do is that i do think it's important for people to value um to value and thing well, essentially products and services that have been produced from an environmentally um, responsible standpoint it sounds tiny in a way but I do think that as consumers start to value this, as enterprises start to value this, as, as um, potential funders start to, val start to value this, this, this creates traction, it creates momentum, right? It makes the topic visible. It creates pressure, it puts pressure on the people who can actually do something um, to, to hold back. So over the past couple of years, we started seeing um, that topic like combating deforestation in the Amazon just rose to prominence within, um, you know, debates that were focused on economics and finance, right? And so it really, in a way, when you, when you shed a light on that, when you spotlight that, and when you get people talking about it and, and making sure that the topic remains visible, it does, I think, in a way, it ends up trickling down and, and it, it adds up. It adds up. And that's something that I think that we can all do in a way we can learn about it and we can we can you know create the demand for more data for more transparency you know or for a greater capacity to track um information about the products that we're consuming for example so i think that that's a do that we can all start doing today right and so um i like that too um for the don't um 
that's something I, I'm going to answer this within the context or the, the question actually framed it like for a foreign audience, but I don't think this is restricted to a foreign audience. I think this is for all of us. And I include myself in this when I started working um, with the Amazon. I think it's important to not romanticize the Amazon. Right. And I think in a way, a lot of people, when we start thinking about the Amazon, we come with this um, sort of bucolic vision um, of pristine forest. And a lot of it is pristine forest in remote areas. Right. But it's important to really understand um, what's going on on the ground. You know, what are the many factors at play? Crime is critical. Illegality, um, the tensions, the, 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 the very harsh um, socioeconomic conditions of the people who are there. Right. And so if we if we treat this from a sort of a very different, from a very distant and taking more of a romantic approach to this, I think it's hard to, to start, you know, tackling the hard questions that need to be addressed so that we can really reconcile environmental um, conservation with a social economic development. So I, I think that those are it's a do and a don't for all of us. Beto, do you want to add something to do's and don'ts? And then we'll ask Rob too. What, are, what does Rob think some, what are some of the most pressing? Don'ts? Well, in the short term, I think Udu needs to be political uh, pressure. And Brazil needs to go into the streets. I think to, for the, for, to, to, to face what we're facing now in the Amazon region, we need political pressure. We need people uh, look at a take position because it, it, it's it's really critical. I think, of course, we need on the do side. We need also to think about uh, opportunities here. There's a lot of opportunity for investment if if things good right in, go in the right direction. Um, and I think on on and I agree with uh, Clarissa that say, I think there is a lot of legitimate interest in the region. I think we have to separate. Uh, those illegitimate interests from those legitimate interests. And I think, as I mentioned, all the sectors can be part of the solution. The agribusiness, the mining sector, the timber, the, let's say the, the typically uh, no timber forest sector, uh, let's say the tourism, we need cities, we need to help put those people on the side of the, the, the good agenda. And, 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 and that's, I think when people, Think the Amazon. Everybody here is it's operating legally, uh, including those people that operate legally. It's really difficult. I think it just hurt more. I think it, it creates more difficult for investment and create more room for people to 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 be poverty. And and I think poverty is not the way to solve it. Problems. So if you get poverty, you get from developing. It's be more difficult to conserve the rainforest. And I think we need to separate those those two kind of sectors. Uh, and not to simplify that uh, all the private sector here is it's it's enemy of the forest. I think a lot of part of the private sector can be and is part of of the solution. So Rob, do you want to to tell us, share with us your do's and your don'ts? We cannot hear you. Excuse me, but don't, does Beto have a don't before we? The do was separate the illegal from the illegal. The way I understood that Beto said the don't don't silo it, don't the, you know the don't exclude uh, okay. people who so, are yes. So I've been using a phrase have called a build, good. Then I get it. Um, I I'm glad it's an, a productive question. I'll just make a couple of comments. One, I have been using the phrase build um, building the middle and depolarizing. Um, in the American context, it's terribly important right now and very difficult to do. Everybody's enjoying not being on, on one side or the other rather than the activity of finding the middle ground. What I'm hearing both of you saying, uh, better and clear, is there is room, there is a, an agenda that will be very productive for Brazil to build a, build a middle around the future of the Amazon, which is not romanticizing, it's uh, never touching it and pretending it, but that would be okay on the one hand and not tearing it all down on the other, but getting industry involved. I'm, I'm impressed with that answer. A don't that I, that, that I didn't, ex didn't expect to hear and didn't hear is one that comes up in some North-South relationships. Don't take away our initiative. Um, 
you have so much productive capacity already that you're not at all worried about that, and neither am I. You have a space agency, which is looking at your own forest. You're not dependent on somebody else's space agency. Um, you have so much horsepower, if you like, in the, in the NGOs. Um, it, what there was a time, perhaps, when we could have been uh, taking the wind out of your sails, taking your initiative away, writing consultants' reports. It's that, that I was trained by Jose Goldenberg and an Indian a physicist named Amulya Reddy, uh, that there was really something, some res restraint on the part of an American institution vis-a-vis -vis the solving of your, in getting engaged with your problems was really an important uh, warning. Don't do that. But I think we've passed that point. I think that there's nothing we can do to, that, will, that will preempt what you're doing because you're so far ahead in getting all this done. And, and that is very, in a way, very refreshing. It is a form of leapfrog. You have leapfrogged into leadership in your own problems. Well, well I'd like to ask well, if there's time that yeah, we yes, haven't please, mentioned uh, whatever went on, what is it that went on in Glasgow vis-a-vis -vis forests and does it make any difference? That's, that's not a, a, I could have made that my third question because I don't understand, I don't know what happened. I would think you had a quite a bit of, would have quite a bit of, of perspective on what the international community through the UN is up to. And does it make any, is it, is it in the, on, the, on the margins or actually could be important? Okay, so Rob, let me bring this, bundle this question together with two other questions that are related. Good, as well. perfect. And uh, so, so that's more like the, 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 the larger uh, global um, uh, macro institutions involved in this and the impact uh, on, on any kind of efforts at tackling deforestation. But João Pedro Vieira uh, asked, he would like to know what was the role of municipalities and states in the fight against deforestation? remembering uh, Clarissa's early uh, uh, comments, right? And what were their incentives and how can they be brought back into the picture now with the larger you know, uh, call now to zero deforestation as Ber Beto said. And then a uh, fascinating question also from João Moreira Salles. He would like to know uh, if it's possible, especially Clarissa from the data that you presented, to isolate the effect that the creation of protection units, unidades de conservação, conservation units, that they had over the reduction of deforestation rates. How did the creation of conservation units impact the pattern of deforestation and whether there was a spillover effect, right, to, to other areas who are not protected? If the, create, if the conservation units had a spillover um, effect as well. And then we have two more questions and I will, I will say them all because my connection is a bit spotty and I, I don't want to crash before saying them, okay? So the, the other question is from, from Malu, from Marisa Lucas, um, regarding policies against deforestation. So you mentioned about compensation for ecosystem services, et cetera, et cetera. Which role do you see indigenous and traditional riverbank, quilombola, maroon community-based territorial monitoring having in terms of law enforcement and surveillance? So how can communities that are in conservation units in their own areas, how can they be part of this surveillance and this monitoring? And then Lucas Pratis asks, um, you see the creation, how do you see the creation of economic value within these traditional territories? We already sp spoke about the cities, the urban, the lack of opportunities, but how do you see the question of um, economic value, agroforestry, et cetera, with, coming from within uh, and addressing the, the plight and the concerns of traditional and indigenous communities as well? So we have like, you know, historical, <laughs> but very granular, localized, but at the same time, macro level questions around um, the comments, the very powerful comments you uh, presented us with. So maybe, uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I will start with the, the role of, of local government at uh, 
I think the local government, state municipality, at state level, uh, has a complementary role. Important, but just be clear. Uh, the federal government has so much power, just in terms of budget, in terms of enforcement, and in terms because the Brazilian law, uh, most of the territory is, is um, let's say, responsibility of the federal government, all the indigenous territory, most of the uh, conservation unit, plus the undesignated public forest, the land reform areas, and a lot of, of the private area, they are not yet uh, titled. So, the role of federal government is absolutely critical. And, and, and that is maybe two thirds, it depends on the federal government. Um, and the state and the municipalities can play a complementary role. And I think that's happened in the past and works relatively well um, because it was. Um, then the question of, say, is, if I understand about the the, the whole aspects of say, the role of surveillance by communities. I think uh, the monitoring systems works pretty well in terms of uh, forest fires, deforestation. Uh, even now, I think forest degradation is getting, getting more uh, um, good satellite imaging. I think for the, for the local ones, the more importance is more on the, let's say, hunting, illegal hunting, or let's say illegal poaching, or sometimes illegal grabbing because people try to grab in your land and they just start on the on the borders i think it, it's it's more i think the the good point that I mentioned the brazilia has a, a kind of golden standard monitoring system using satellite images it's a very very efficient and, and more and more um let's say technology and and developing put in place i think state level has those capacity community has, has the, same, the same capacity as well on the agroforestry, let's say agroforestry kind of market product, I think it, usually you think it's, it's relatively small, but actually it's quite big. A uh, study by, by Salo Kozlovic was presented here at um, one of the seminars. It, it's, it's almost $200 billion a uh, uh, year um, that, that I think is, is increasing. And I think there was a lot of fortunate for those communities to be part of this market in a good way. And, and use, of course, new technology, let's say the, the leapfrogging uh, idea. So, and I think there's a lot of things going on in this direction. There's some good, let's say, good initiatives, but it, it, it needs those kind of uh, political framework to create a, a, a place for, uh, for security, for rule of law and, and, and the protection, because otherwise that, that'd be difficult to operate those initiatives in the, in, in, a, in the situation that we have now. So I, I'll give you the rest for, for Clarice to complement. Thank you, Beth. Clarissa? Great, Beth covered a lot there. So I'm just gonna quickly comment on two of his points and then I'll, I'll address the, the one about the protected territories, right? So I think about the role of the municipalities and the states, because I mentioned, oh, we don't have as much evidence about some of the subnational initiatives. Right. And in many of these states, um, after that federal policy action plan, they actually developed state um, action plans, right, for combating deforestation. But the truth is that um, academia hasn't assessed many of these subnational efforts yet. Right. So we, the evidence there is a little bit more frail. That said, um, given the, the current scenario, there was actually this, um, let's say, this vacuum that was created um, as the federal government. Although it is their responsibility, as Beth rightly um, pointed out, there was this sort of vacuum, right, of who's going to do something about this. And so I expect that over the past, like over the past few years, we did see a lot of um, subnational initiatives um, pop up and, and an effort, and this gained a lot of visibility. But I do think that we need to have rigorous assessments of these efforts to try to understand how they contributed and at what scale they did. But it is very tricky because as Vetu mentioned, like if you take Pará, for example, that's the, the leading state in deforestation, about 70% of state territory is actually under federal um, responsibility, right? For combating deforestation. So there are some very significant limitations there about what the state can actually do. But I do think that this, this vacuum that was unfortunately created by this dismantling is an opportunity for these states um, and, and more local governments um, to step up. Um, about the, 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 um, territory, like the, the, the monitoring that's based on these communities, I, I do think just adding to, to what Bethu already um, 
answered. I do think that there's an, an interesting rule there is that it adds a lot of visibility. Protected territories, right? protected areas, indigenous communities, there's a, a lot of people care about what's going on there. Even when you have data being, being like when you read the media, a lot of the dashboards that we have for, for public data, they always have like, well, what's going on in the Amazon? What's going on in these specific territories? And I think that that's, um, um, it plays a big role, right? Because it adds visibility, it adds pressure, it keeps people, you know, we, we all have like a magnifying glass over what's going on in these territories. And so I do think that this adds to this general sense, not only do we have a legal framework for protection of these territories, right? We also have sort of this, this, um, this framework of just people really pay attention to what's going on in there, right? And I do think that that's um, relevant. It hasn't been quantified, but I do think that I, I expect that that plays um, a significant role, right, in contributing to to um, um, to to what we see in these territories. Now, about the specific um, question about is it possible to isolate the effect that the creation of these protected territories had, right, over the reduction in deforestation rate? I mentioned that to ter territorial protection is one of the most widely used conservation policies in the world, right, now, and in Brazil as well, and it has been used for decades. Now, what changed? Um, and within the scope of the policy action plan is that uh, the, the federal government was intentionally assigning areas that were under a lot of deforestation pressure to protection, right? Because a lot of protected territories in the Amazon and in the world, they're in fairly remote areas, right? And so they're, they're far from deforestation pressures, at least from imminent deforestation pressures. Maybe you'll get there someday, but at the moment, it's not that close. Right. And so when you actually assess, um, um, when you statistically assess their impact, sometimes you see, well, it doesn't look like the, it doesn't look like these territories had an impact on deforestation. That's because they wouldn't have had deforestation either way within that time period. So within the scope of the policy action plan, what changed was that Brazil, as I mentioned, it, it said, well, let's try to use these territories as a barrier right, to advancing deforestation. And that actually gave us an opportunity to empirically test what was going on in these regions. And so what we see, I'm saying we because this is an analysis that we have done um, at um, CPI, what we see there is that these protected areas, they do protect forests that are, un, that are within these territories, right? They have what we call like a local protection effect. However, it's as if they were a shield. You have deforestation that's moving towards these territories, and then you set up protection and deforestation won't move into it, but it will spill into another area. So essentially what we find is that although protected territories do work in the sense that they, they prevent deforestation from entering that territory, we don't see an impact, a significant impact on the overall level of deforestation, right? So deforestation won't happen within protected territories, but it will move elsewhere. And that's important. It's not to say that territory, that, that, that protection doesn't work. It does work. It is protecting that specific area, but it highlights the importance of designing these conservation policies um, within a larger framework that will, will um, explore complementary um, policy efforts. Right, so it's important to protect this territory. We're gonna, that's gonna serve as a shield for advancing deforestation, but this deforestation activity is gonna move elsewhere. So we need to, if we wanna reduce deforestation rates, um, like overall deforestation levels, we need to make sure that, that we prevent that deforestation from moving um, elsewhere, right? So the question specifically asked about the spillover effect, that is in fact what we find, right? It, it, it hits that barrier and then it moves elsewhere and then you see deforestation. Okay. I think one, one element I think is because we didn't complete the job because we still have a lot of area that not designated. So it's still open for those illegal uh, deforestation. And I think we need to test it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point I think you make, you made. At the time, it really helps to move down deforestation in a high in a, in a search level, no way it's 80%. And but if you look at now, it's the deforestation pick up, not in the, in the neighbor areas of the protected area, but actually far from there in a, in a kind of, it's a far frontier 
where the lands are not protected, the forests are not protected. So we need, really... we, we, we need to we need to to finish the job. <laughs> Okay. So, so really Rob, good point, Ben. But when we say yeah. spillover, it's not that it's spilling over to the right, you know, the, the region that's just the south of outside protection, right? It's just that it's moving into other areas of the Amazon. So I absolutely agree. We need to we need to finish the job, right? We we're protecting here, but we need to keep an eye on what's going on over there. Yeah. So so uh, we, we are pro we have a few minutes left, so we're approaching the end. But I I want to bring Rob back into the conversation. Rob, there is a uh, there is a there, there's a question about uh, people got very excited with the with the images about uh, the three de three degree increase in temperature and what it does. Is that at Climate Central? So, so and where can people access that? So many people asked about that. It's about worried yeah. now. Everybody is worried now. Is that, your... <laughs> that, that that visualizing that visualization? So people are interested in that. Um, but then, Rob, I uh, cannot hear you. So. This three degrees Celsius, if we, if we, if we, if we, if we lost the Amazon, so if we keep it the Amazon, the, the Rio de Janeiro is safe. <laughs> <laughs> the, the absolutely right, right way to think about it. They're linked in that way. You know, Climate Central, uh, two words, is on the web. And the, you go to their website, the sea level visualizations are the first, first thing you see. Um, and there's lots and lots of uh, detail. And then you can write someone there if you're interested in something they haven't got. Uh, and, and it's not that easy to navigate. I was having trouble yesterday getting, I got those images directly from a Climate Central person because I was in a hurry, uh, but there, it's lots of slide, sliders so that you can pick your temperature rise and go for the extreme or the median estimate. Lots of, mm -hmm. there are lots of games you can play and, and it's remarkable how much they're doing and they keep adding to the database. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I don't want to give you a name, because she'll be flooded with it, with requests. Okay. But, 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 but Climate Central is you know, it's a friendly yeah, place. I, I, want to, I want to bring you back into the conversation uh, as a, with some, some final thoughts here. Because you are a big picture thinker, you're a humanistic thinker, you're a planetary thinker, but you're also a very pragmatic thinker, right? So, so, so given what you heard about the challenges, the opportunities, and the visions that's coming out of this wonderful group of scholars, interdisciplinary, committed, you know. So, so how, which role do you see richer nations, the United States, multilateral institutions, you know, like how do you see them participating in this, in this new vision for the Amazon? Right, uh, and so, so, so I, I was just pick your brain here because I know that you engage with the question with very powerful stakeholders in the world of energy. And I just wonder if you can think with us a little bit from that perspective here. Let me give my answer in two parts. One, I, I'd love Beto's comment about don't romanticize, but also don't get distracted by illegality. If you could get all of the, if you could take every criminal off the, out of the picture, we would have a major question still in the society about how to, how to, what kind of vision for the Amazon you actually want. Um, there is obviously criminality just gets in the way of thinking about some of the questions about alternate visions that I was bringing up because it is the first order of business is to stop the crime. Um, when it comes to the West, there's so much we can do that is unhelpful. I mean, we haven't said anything about uh, the, the enormous demands on your resources for export. Uh, your soybeans or, or, or beef or whatever is not just for domestic consumption. And so we have the whole question of how we're going to handle the world's economy uh, so that Brazil's pre the pressure on Brazil's resources uh, stay reasonable. And then who's making the money when that, when that does happen? And is it, is it in fact something that you want to control how much soybean you actually produce? And then is there hunger if you do that? I mean, we have a world food economy coupled with the climate economy, but the food economy is complicated enough. Um, that's why I think the illegality is in the way of raising questions like that, where the American in, in, or the Chinese role in, in Brazil may be primarily in stimulating exports. And, and we have to con contend with what that means. Uh, you, your exports are under your control uh, to some extent. But we had a ban on exporting oil from the but exporting natural gas 
was it? which was it from our and then we had a major change in the policy that we were allowed to do um because we wanted to keep it all at home so you have you have a whole dimension there of interacting with the rest of the world you are a very resource rich place it's going to be difficult and then the other is of course that the demand the biological solutions to climate change can be very destructive and you have to be really careful about about, for example, turning Amazon into a source of biofuels, um, which could almost be justified if you didn't care about it in environmental values and biodiversity and whatnot. You grow only grow plantations of one kind or another and produce biofuels for the world, and then we don't need coal, oil, and gas anymore. There's a lot of a lot of growth pressures that are going to be very, very dangerous that you have to be on guard about. And, and, and they do <laughs> no, no, this, we, we, we will continue. You're letting me to go bigger than I could possibly go. No, but, I, but, but maybe as, I, as, I, as Clarissa and Beth to prepare their final one minute comments, uh, departing comments, in the spirit of continuing the conversation later on, and hopefully here in Princeton uh, next year. Uh, Rob, before we began, when we were in the backstage of Zoom, um, we mentioned the conversation we had on Sunday at, um, at the, at the at the Literary Fair in Brazil with João Moira Salles and Rob Nixon. And, uh, and João, João Salles' comment that, that, uh, that Brazil, that we have not been able to, to place the Amazon in the national, in the public imaginary, right? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, you, and then you said, but it's not impossible or it's not too late. So, 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 so I'm just curious, how do you see that question? Because the question of, climate change has been politicized in the United States in a certain way, right? So, yes. so I, I would like to hear your thoughts about that. How does one get the younger generation? How does one get the consumers to involve in Brazil so that, so that, so that the question that now is a planetary nexus, the Amazon, you know, is taken care of and a matter of concern for Brazilians themselves? I know that you don't want to pontificate and speak in the name of anyone, but I, I'm just curious of ideas that you might have. Well, it's a puzzle to me that the Amazon is not um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the imagination of the Brazilians uh, in one way or the other as an area of economic growth and exploitation on the one hand or, or major conservation effort. I would have thought that there would be such an argument that both sides would be rather well developed and it would be quite possibly uh, polarized in an unpleasant fashion. Um, perhaps it's an advantage that you have some time to build the middle uh, so that neither, that, so that doesn't become a, a, a centrifugal conversation. Uh, that maybe it's hopeful that you don't have uh, so much fixation on the road building and the manifest destiny uh, arguments that, that, were, that dominated the United States in the for 100, I mean, second half of the 19th century, much of the 20th. So, uh, you know, more power to you. We we should you're in charge and and you're you couldn't be more talented and and, and level headed you're not so that's I think what we want is building the middle. I don't think I fully answered your question, but if that's going on, I think others can support it uh, from outside. Maybe that'll help us build the middle. Watching you build the middle, you're ahead of us. That's fantastic. Yeah. So Beato and Carissa, some final remarks, some final words you want to leave us with. I think uh, Clarissa <laughs> mentioned quite well that uh, we know, we have, to, we have uh, accumulate knowledge in the public policy, how to deal with, uh, let's say, deforestation and illegality. And, and I think it's, it's something that we can count on um, the next political moment when the election comes and the political will might be back again. And I think we, we can go further. I think we, we are improving our understanding about the, the deforestation dynamics, the land grabber aspects. Uh, of course, the discussion today was not about the development aspects or the solutions. It might be another uh, section we are going to, to, to address this. But I think Amazonia 2030 is actually, and uh, the, the spirit of the conversation, look in the, the middle ground, look in the, find the pet solutions on the short term that keeps standing 
and generate some economic benefits or with a major, let's say, political and economic force that we can set aside as a partner in the transition. And of course, look at for partnership with the, the rest of the planet. So partnership in, in a different fields, um, technical and scientific cooperation, uh, investment and collaboration on the payment for environmental service. So we need an international collaboration. I think it's pretty clear that for, for doing this leapfrogging, we need uh, a lot of kind of collaborations and investment and in a, in a, in a, in a deep and, and profound dialogue like we have today. But the good, I think the, let's say the lessons learned in the process, we know how to fight deforestation, I think. And, and, and that was a good point that Clarissa made very well in the presentation. Um, and, and Brazil was in the past uh, a country that they inspire all the countries and how to address this kind of problem. And I think we, we have the commitment and the obligation to address this, this crisis. This is our problem. It's not affect the planet, but it is our problem and we, and we are going to, to address. Uh, and that's our commitment on this aspect. Thank you, Beto. Clarissa? I think that was a, just a great closing remark by Beto. There's, um, I'm really just gonna echo it. And in, in many ways, um, I mean, the, the topic of this debate was well, the, the, the key role of public policies, right? And, and they are critical, right? We, we have evidence that showed that they're critical, but I feel like in many ways, they're, they're the first layer, they're the foundation in a way, right? We need to implement policies that work to protect the forest, right? We know what needs to be done. We know what needs to improve, right? We're, we're gaining more knowledge on this. But in many ways, we, we implement that to protect the forest so that we have room to advance with other very necessary efforts, right? That are more focused on incentives, on promoting sustainable development in the region, right? And including policies that are needed to address this, right? To address the, the, the severe, um, the, the, the fragility of property rights in the reason. So conservation policies, they are fundamental, but in many ways, they're sort of, they're, they're the first step to further, you know, um, sustainable development in the Amazon. So I'm just going to wrap up with that and just take the opportunity to thank you guys for this incredibly rich discussion. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What a powerful and enlightening conversation. And unfortunately, we have to, we have to stop here, but the questions raised will stay with us, as will the panelists' sincere and visionary commitment to safeguarding uh, the Amazon for Brazil and the planet. So thank you so much, Beto, Clarissa, and Rob, great. for joining us today and for all you do. We are also thankful to the High Meadows Environmental Institute for continued partnership and to the staff of Amazonia 2030, who has worked closely with Mikael Smugi and Rodrigo Simon in producing uh, the series on Amazonian futures. We are already planning a follow-up series for early in the spring, so stay tuned. For our viewers, thank you so much for watching. We hope you will be here with us for future Brazil Lab events. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So stay well, happy holidays, everyone, and see you in the new year. Take good care. Ciao.